Rebecca Jackson told me of another very specific link with Jewish culture. This is one cubit. Okay. And this is two, two. cubits. Okay. So this is what would have been used as a tool of measurement, right? Right. So let's check it out. That's two cubits in width, certainly, right? right? And across, yeah, that's one. That's two. Point there. Three. The shroud's dimensions are in the units used in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, the cubit. What does that suggest to you then? The whole thing checks out in terms of the measurement yeah. of the shroud in the cubit. The shroud has many of the hallmarks of a Jewish burial cloth. And Dr. Jackson believes there is evidence that connects the shroud directly to the shroud in the Gospels. The most detailed account of what the disciples saw in the empty tomb is the Gospel of John. He mentions the face cloth, but he also mentions burial cloths in the plural. That must include the shroud that wrapped the corpse, but the plural indicates that there was yet another cloth, and that has puzzled New Testament scholars. Well, Jackson believes he has identified the other cloth in the shroud itself, in a strip of cloth sewn along one side. This is a transmitted image. It's a transmitted light image. It's an absorption image. And it's the shroud is being held up. Jackson owns this backlit image of the shroud taken in 1978. And it shows clearly that the bands of discoloration from the weaving go right through the seam from the main cloth to the strip, showing that it was part of the original cloth, then torn off and then re-sewn back on again. Could this side strip be the missing cloth alluded to in John's Gospel? Here's the side strip on the shroud. Right. Let me just show you. It's essentially the, the length of the actual shroud okay. itself. Right. Okay. So we're going to use this mm -hmm. to finish off what I'm proposing to Explains be... Explains that right. movement of the cloth. So, uh, now remember, the bottom of the feet have blood on them. Right. And so that has to be held in place. So I'm going to take the bottom part. So let's put a small knot here at the bottom. And we're going to wrap this around. And we're going to make it rather tight because we, got to we have to hold the body together. Exactly. So that's the bit that would have held the knees together. Yeah. As see, see what this is doing? That's, it's going to hold the legs together, which, which holds the knees, which is what we observe on the shroud. Now that, now that we've held... The way the strip fastens the cloth around the body conforms to the way the body is represented on the shroud. We're going to have to. When we look here at the bottom of the chin, notice the disruption that occurs in the cloth. I think that we can see that echoed if we go over here to the negative image. Okay. We can see the, the hair on either side of the face, but when we get down, it looks like the hair, suddenly there's a disruption, at least to my eye, and we sit in it over here. I think there's also a disruption in the beard. There's something here, and I would submit that that's yes. consistent with uh, what we are inducing by folding on the cloth here. Jackson's side strip theory could answer the question that's puzzled students of the New Testament. I asked Jackson if he would submit his solution to an expert on John's Gospel in a real first century tomb in Jerusalem itself. I've arranged for Dr. Jackson to present his theory to Dr. Stephen Need, a New Testament scholar. So this is uh, just the sort of tomb that's referred to in the Gospel. Jackson has laid out the body in the tomb, wrapped according to his reconstruction from the shroud, complete with the torn off side strip tied around it. For accuracy, 
the sudarium or face cloth that John's Gospel describes is also in position. Then, just before Dr. Need's arrival, the body is removed to leave just the cloths. It's very striking to come into a, a real tomb in Jerusalem and to see um, the clothes lying there like that. It fits in with the Johannine picture, but if that piece of cloth that was torn off at the time of the burial um, was indeed a separate piece of cloth, that would explain the plural. If Jackson is right, then this arrangement of burial cloths may be a closer representation of what John's Gospel says the disciples saw when they walked into the tomb on the third day after Jesus' death. The side strip links the Shroud of Turin to the Gospel of John and the first century AD. But perhaps the most direct evidence linking the Shroud of Turin to the time of Jesus is an archaeological find made in Jerusalem itself. I've come to the Israel Museum to hear about a discovery made in 1968. Archaeologists unearthed the remains of a victim of Roman crucifixion dating from the time of Jesus. The relevant find was a single heel bone which challenged the way we imagined crucifixion and the museum has agreed to let me see it. Now, what Ellie has just handed to me is the only evidence that we have of the victim of a crucifixion. The key thing is that this nail did not go through the front of the foot, but through the side of the heel. Grooves on the victim's ulna bone also show that he was nailed through the wrists. These finds overturn the convention that Jesus was nailed through the front of the feet and his palms. And so they're a benchmark for the true age of the shroud. Crucifixion disappeared along with the Roman Empire. Later artists showed the nails going through the front of the feet and the palms. I would expect a medieval forger to have followed the same convention. But if the method of crucifixion is distinctly Roman, then it's more likely to be from the time of Jesus. I've asked two specialists, Peter Dean, a forensic medical examiner, and Dr. Neil Svensson, an expert on the shroud, to assess whether the type of crucifixion represented on the image conforms to Christian iconography or to Roman methods of execution. This area. There are the wounds you would expect to find from the descriptions in the Gospels. The scourging, for example. 